Michael Kramer. Welcome on the show, man. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. This is, uh, okay, real quick. Are you from Omaha? Uh, I grew up in Northeast Nebraska. Okay. A little town called Hardington. How does somebody f- uh, from a little town called Hardington, H- Hardington. Hardington, yeah. Be a co-author with Chris Voss. Uh, God appointed. I think it was a divine appointment, right? God said, you and Chris go. No, I'm totally making that. No, <laughs> that like, oh, God appointed. I yeah. think you said you got appointed. No, God. I was like, who appointed you? Yeah, no. God. And, and, and who is God Chris, and who is who Chris is, Voss? Don't, don't say for, who for, is God. <laughs> <laughs> no. and, and, and for anybody that doesn't know, which most people should that listen to this, who, who is Chris Voss? So Chris Voss is uh, actually from Mount Pleasant, Iowa. I don't know if you knew that. Mm, did not. So, and he was a cop in Kansas City. And then he went to the FBI and uh, worked for a period of time uh, as a uh, suicide hotline for Boys Town uh, operator or whatever they really? call those folks because he wanted to become an FBI hostage negotiator. And they said the best place to learn negotiation is when somebody's life is on the line. So wow. he, he worked for Boys Town. I, it, well, I, honestly, I don't know if it was Boys Town or not. It was a suicide prevention. He's from Kansas City at the time. I'm guessing it was Boys Town. I haven't asked him that. Uh, but he became the number one hostage negotiator for the FBI and was there for 25 years. Yeah. So how did you negotiate your way into a book deal <laughs> with him? I well, mean, that's, a, that's, that's truly amazing. When I first, I think I saw this maybe a year ago that you were working on it, probably. I believe. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I lose track of time, but it was probably about a year ago. Uh, it goes back to when I first read his book, Never Split the Difference, which he's yep. famous for. And... It, guys, it was just a um, like an epiphany for me where as I'm listening to how he's training you to use these tools to negotiate, I had, I had for years I had subscribed to Getting to Yes, mm. which is written by it's some Harvard book. professors. Good, good book. Great book. And I thought that's how you negotiate. And Chris completely flipped that on its head and said, you want to go for no. And like, that was the first thing that I heard him say that kind of got my antenna up. And as I read it, it really started to sink in. And I watched literally every bit of content I could find on Chris Voss. We rewrote all the scripts for our business. So any cold calling script, any seller meeting scripts, anything at all that we, we deal with that we have scripted all has never split the difference or as Chris would, would summarize it as tactical empathy woven throughout. And so I had subscribed to the newsletters. I'm consuming all the content. And I think it's just because I was a super user of this stuff. Like they saw me asking for stuff all the time uh, that they reached out and said, hey, he's going to write a book. And we're looking for some co-authors to come alongside that have used this stuff and to share their experience. Would you be interested? I'm like, yes, I am. Wow. (laughs) It's unreal. Yeah. So it was sort of, God appointed, not got, God. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, it was just by chance. I didn't reach out. It was just a uh, happenstance. I get the email, I responded. And I, the process as I understand it is that we had to submit a story. My process was I had to submit a story. And they had, if it was a decent enough story, they would give me a ghostwriter and an editor. And so they did. And it ended up making the book. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And I, I would, you know, also add to that, that from their point of view, you showed a repetition, you showed up, you, you did the work, and then you were actually showing the discipline to execute on these things. So many times, and I'm, a, I'm just making assumptions, but your correspondence with them was not like, hey, send me more stuff. It, no. w- it was probably like, hey, I'm working on these different tactics. Yes. Do you have any different information, et cetera, that can That's be right. utilized within my business? So you were, you were not just a, a student, you were a practitioner of it. That's and, right. And I think that's, that's the next step where people sometimes get stuck. They, they either consume or they, they want it to be given to them, but you kind of did all the pieces and were just utilizing and honestly showing interest, which I'm assuming is one of the biggest, you know, congratulations or, you know, kudos to an author is that somebody's actually reading and utilizing their book. What, what higher compliment than to defer to someone's advice, mm. right? Like if you, the, 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 they say on the spectrum of respect, the most respectful thing you can do to somebody is to ask for their advice and follow it. Right. 
That's deference. And that's what I was doing with Chris. It, it, I will tell you guys, I liken it to learning to play the piano, which I'm not a pianist. So anybody that's listening that plays piano, I'm sorry if I'm going to disrespect how this all works, but I understand that there's chords and it seemed like these tools that Chris was teaching, such as mirroring or labeling or summarizing, which you just did, which led to me to say, that's right, um, are like playing chords. And it's not a natural thing. It feels uncomfortable to start with. But once you start to play these chords a little bit, you see the, you see the person you're talking to respond differently. That's when the light went on for me because it was very uncomfortable for me to play these chords, but I stuck with it. And then I started to see responses. So you just practiced and practiced just and practiced an actual real life practice. Yeah. Low stakes conversations right. is what Chris says. Practice in low stakes environments, you know, talk to the teller at the bank mm. or the gas station or your kids. Yeah. So what type of, had you practiced kids. anything like kids. this before or what type of, mind shifts did this have? I, you know, I just had an appointment with, um, a, a gentleman yesterday and we were kind of talking about this and getting ourselves into the other person's perspective before we speak. Like, Dude. I mean, the, the smartest person in the room is not the person who talks the most. It's the person who listens the most and really taking the time. That's why I haven't been talking very much. <laughs> that, that's right. It's that's true leadership. Chris. <laughs> that, that is, it's one of those things that everybody wants to, to speak and, be heard, but, but truly it's allowing others to speak, putting yourself in their shoes so that you can have a, a meaningful conversation from their perspective. Cause otherwise it's just two people talking into the ethos. There's you're, you're hitting it right on the head, Colin, because the way Chris Voss says it is that if you walk into a, a conversation and you're wed to an idea or an outcome, and in our business, it's real estate. I, I want to buy this property, right? So we show up and this is what the conversation's about. And there's competing interests. Like the definition of a high stakes conversation, according to another book called Crucial Conversations, is the stakes are high, the opinions vary, emotions are strong. That's all real estate transactions. Yep, my house is worth this. That's it. I, I need to make this much money. That's right. Yeah, so all of these things are making it a high stakes conversation. And so what Chris says, instead of going in saying, let's make it about this, Find a way to express understanding. There's a difference between saying, I understand, right? People say to express, to be empathetic, you have to say, I understand. Chris says that's not right. He says in order to be empathetic, you have to express understanding. And the way you express understanding is through usually a summary, right? But to get to the true understanding, you have to use mirrors and labels and accusations audits to really distill it down because when you get that true summary where somebody says, you get me, you got exactly what I'm, what I'm wanting and what I need, you get a that's right. It's in that moment where Chris says there's a, um, and it was from a neuroscientist, I think he just reported it, but there's a synapsis that's connected in the brain, a micro epiphany. And it's like a, an aha moment that we have and that cements our relationship. I know someone's so good at that. My father-in-law, he's a psychiatrist <laughs> and he's been doing it for, for a very long time. And I did my, my, I had a light bulb go off when you were explaining this. Cause you can, not only is he better at listening than me, cause you know, I can get my ADHD going around here, but he's looking at you and then he summarizes what you said in an empathetic way. And you're like, Oh, this guy heard me. He gets me. He gets me. And when somebody gets you, how do you feel? I Great. feel heard and awesome. And what do you want to do in that moment? You want to walk away or you want to get closer? I'm going to sell on my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's so what it, the point of all this, you guys, is you do this. So what? Why do you do this? Well, you do it so you can start to collaborate. Yeah, trust. Yeah. Well, yeah, trust. Absolutely. That's the foundation. Collaborate, Bill, yeah. It's ultimately the collaboration because once you guys have this connection, now all of a sudden this can come back into, into play. But instead of it being here, it's out here and we're on the same side of the desk and we're talking about how to solve this problem. Mm. And that's where the power's at. Is he still putting on like uh, seminars and whatnot? Oh yeah. 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 He's wow. a lot. It's called black swan training. Yeah. 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 No, that's interesting. Um, so last week, two weeks ago, um, 
was about to have a property under contract that Chris and I and two other partners are purchasing, just a small portfolio. All of a sudden the deal blows up. We wanted to get an insurance claim assigned. It wasn't communicated correctly. And the seller's known to never talk to buyers. You know, he's been doing this for 40 years. And he's like, yeah. I don't want to talk to the buyer. And I, you know, I kind of asked the agent, I was like, I, I think we can clear things up. And it was amazing. You just let the individual speak. You acknowledge their grievances you understand what their problem is. The problem was, you know, I want to make sure that this closes. I want my cash, but this was something new that I wasn't expecting this assignment of claims. You know, I wanted to basically wanted to take the money from it. You know, that was his plan. And, you know, my response was that's completely understandable and fine. And, you know, we can make this incredibly easy, but also, you know, I, I just wanted to have the conversation with you, give it to you from my point of view. And if this doesn't work, there's honestly no hard feelings because, you know, I, I think you'll do well on these properties, but you know, this is kind of my offer and it's foolish for me and you as, as investors, you know, if I'm purchasing something to not have this assignment of claims when it's sitting right there in front of me, it's, right. it's, it's, it's bad business on my side for myself and my investors and 20 minute conversation. He said, you know, I'll think about it. Call you back tomorrow. He called the agent 20 minutes later and said, yeah, I'll accept the offer. And yeah. it's, you know, 800,000 below what it was listed for. That's so. huge. That's huge. But to have, I think the, the point in all that Colin is to have the courage to invite that conversation because so many times, and let me ask you, did you have in your mind a fear a worry about what he might say? at all? No, not really. I was, I wanted to make sure that it was kind of clear from my side, my intent, because I, I mean, I mean, sometimes, you know, not, not beating on agents, but sometimes there's something lost. <laughs> there's lost in the sauce there. Yeah. Um, and there's also once, once again, to your point, there's competing interests, of course, because the agent's looking for the commission and that's just getting the deal done at, at whatever whatever stakes it is. Let's get it to close. Let, let's get it to close. So they're going to put pressure on me to yeah. not force something. And they're going to put pressure on him to accept something, but then representing him, the pressure's on me. So it, no, I, I didn't have fear. It was more of just, you know, hearing his side because oftentimes, especially people in this business, we get solicited all the time. Do you want to sell your property? Hey, I'll give you this. And there's ridis, r ridiculous negotiations that are going on. So we as investors that are really busy, we shut down. Yeah. So I was like, if I can just open it up, listen to him, hear his concerns, you know, basically, as you said, mirroring, repeat back to him his concerns, alleviate those concerns through, you know, past experiences and, you know, what I am saying in front of him, you know, the, the worst thing that happens is it's a no, but it's at least a, a solid relationship for hopefully future transactions. Absolutely. And I, I think you're unique in the sense that your narrative yeah. of what might go wrong didn't get in your way. Yeah. I would argue that most people have a narrative of if I open this up, I'm going to lose the deal. There's a scarcity like this deal matters so much to me yep. that I'm afraid if I have this conversation, it might go sideways or might fall apart. And the way you said it of, I'm paraphrasing, if it doesn't work with this assignment, that's okay. Right? Like I'm not wed to getting this deal done. Yes. But if it, if in order to do it, if we're going to collaborate and have this deal work, this has to be something we consider. So let's talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a huge um, sign of maturity. Oh, I wouldn't go and, there. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> it is because you're self-aware enough to say, this is something inside that I need to deal with. Your narrative that usually competes against that, what we want, because we're, we're thinking our mind naturally goes to all the objections, right? We have this idea and then all the reasons why it won't work. We're gifted that way. Our brain's wired that way. We have to be able to set that aside like you did and so, have the conversation. Uh, so outside of objections, what, what else do you think are some faults or fallacies or difficulties that individuals have when having those conversations that kind of lead to a conversation similar to I had, and I'm sure many that you have to the deal falling apart. So obviously it's the fear. What, what other items do you think? I, I think it is rooted in fear. And the emotions that come out of that, um, I, I generally call it scarcity versus abundance, um, which, you know, our, our, our belief is that we're people of faith. We believe that God owns everything and that we're stewards. And so that belief, that framework allows us to enter these conversations truly as a helper and not as like, if this is meant to be, then it will happen. We're going to do everything in our power 
if it makes sense to move forward. And cause that's our, that's our, for our family, it's for our business. Um, but the deal is always, it's on the list, but it's four or five, not one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so how do you enter into that headspace without having a belief or a self-awareness or a comfort in the ability to negotiate through, not negotiate like in terms of trying to get a deal, navigate through these conversations and sit in it without really knowing what the outcome is going to be. Because if you don't have faith to do that, why would you try it? Like, I'm afraid I'm not going to get this deal. So let's just talk about this deal. Yeah. I think you have to be interested. That's a great way to say it. Actually. Yeah. I think you need to really, uh, to be honest, it's, I read it in one of the negotiation books that I've, I've, I mean, you have to be really interested in what they're saying. It's the only way you're going to hear them and they feel it. You're, I didn't mean to put my hand up. Like, don't say anymore. Shut up, Chris. <laughs> no, no I was like, on. that's it. Dude. I'm not interested in what you're saying. Um, I'm, Mr. Leader. Man. <laughs> you know, also something I think, and, and it's after, and I'm, I'm guessing here, but, and Chris is really good at this. And Chris is really good at storytelling, bringing things back. I'm usually a little more direct. Um, but after you find that interest, I, I think then providing points of view that allow them to look through your lens because yep. they know you're interested. And one of those tactics that Chris taught me to do is, you know, after you underwrite the property, bring those and be forthright with the the seller. Like this is the underwriting. This is the future value. This is what I'm going to do with it. And these are the numbers after completion, after I put in my work. And this is really where it lies. And I think after you start stating those items, after you've built, you know, confidence, interest, you know, collaboration, yep. that they then are able to see it from not, not so much of a hostile, you know, conf- conflicting manner, but more of like, okay, wow, this is, this person's put together, these are actually the numbers. And, you know, unless I get really lucky that this is actually where it pans out. Right. Yeah. It's helped us a lot too, because sometimes the response has been, your numbers are probably right, but I I still want to keep shooting for the moon. That's fair. But then we have an understanding. That's it. I get it, man. You know what? We sold stuff and stuff for the moon too. Like no big deal. We get it. I just want to let you know where I'm coming from. I'm not a low baller. I'm not a tire kicker. Like, this is all we can afford. So, and that many times is endearing. It's huge. And yeah. many times it's worked because it's, they, they've realized, Oh, well, I see where he's coming from. Yeah. I, <clears throat> there, I want to piggyback on that real quick, Chris, mm-hmm. before you pivot, if you don't mind, yeah. you guys, um, I, you probably heard of Gary Brecka. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Absolutely. he has this, I took some perfect aminos this morning. Yeah, I did too. Actually <laughs> <laughs> guys selling our product. Gosh, yeah. dang it. I was in the sauna and the plunge. Don't worry. guys. <laughs> <laughs> I aspire to that one day. Um, Come on over. We should yeah, do it. I started I'd, the day off with a swim and then I'd love it. Workout sauna plunge. That's Absolutely. Awesome. I would love it. We should do it. Yeah. So, uh, he has a, um, bit, I don't know if it's a real or a short that is about authenticity. Have you guys seen this? Mm-hmm. No. So he, he starts the question with, or starts the conversation with measuring energy. They have, they, they have, scientists have the ability to measure energy from people. I don't know how they do it, but there's a room where there's no other waves is how he describes it. And they measure the energy that each person in that room is emitting. And he asks then the audience, what is the most powerful energy that a human can release? And there's all of the, what would you say the, the, the most powerful emotions are uh, energy. Lo- love. Love is a big one. What I've, what's, what's, what's unfortunate is I can't think of it, but I've actually heard this short. Yeah. So it's anger, hate, love. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, authenticity. authenticity. Yeah. I, I he said that. it's 400 times more powerful than love. Mm-hmm. Authenticity. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So think about this, what you just said, Chris, mm-hmm. when you say, here's our, here's our underwriting. This is what it is. Brecca says that the definition of authenticity is to, to say the truth and to believe what you're saying. Mm. If you tell the truth and you believe what you're saying, it's 400 times more powerful. The energy is 400 times more powerful than love. And in a negotiation, what's more powerful than just being authentic with, here's what the deal is. Yeah. Right. We had someone leave our, I love that clip because I, I thought about that and I thought about us too. We were making fun of empathetic. Uh, I certainly have empathy and I don't want to pivot off of this, what you were saying. Sometimes it gets in the way. 
Sure. You know, especially as, you know, a co-founder of a business stuff, sometimes we're trying to make smart business decisions, but I'm being empathetic to people's feelings. And sometimes people's feelings aren't the number one way to make the business better, but it can be a, it can be a blessing and a curse. Um, we had someone leave one of our most recent dinners and the gentleman walked up and said, look, I know somebody who invests with you guys. Um, I'm going to invest with you guys. Sure. It's because that guy over there did it, but I want to let you know that after hearing you all speak tonight, I just know you're good people. Yeah. I know you're being honest with me and I'm going to invest. And like, I didn't think of that clip, but I was like, that's, I'm so happy to hear that because yeah. that's what we try to do. And that connected with him. And that's why he's investing, not because of real estate, yeah. not because his friends investing, yeah. but he just, he, he feels we're authentic. I felt, I was just going to say, I bet he felt you're authentic. Yeah. I bet he thought it was real. And I'm guessing you guys told the truth and you believe what you said. We did. So, well, absolutely. We, cause, cause we point out pros and cons. I mean, yeah. Yeah. anybody's we're, we're selling, perfect. Anybody yeah. selling a perfect uh, is, is not being very accurate. So I don't want to pivot. I'm going back to a little bit, uh, back a little bit. Well, Colin was very kind and why his interaction with the seller went well. It, it, it's because Colin's good with people. He's authentic, sincerely, all those things. Um, one of the reasons there was a little trepidation and or a little stutter there, uh, there, there were agents involved and the message was getting lost. Um, now in your situations where you're cold calling a lot of sellers directly, you don't have to worry about that. I'm curious from a seasoned inv uh, investor and negotiator, what's the best way to do it when agents are involved? And, and my caveat, my short answer that usually I'll ask the agent, can we all get on a call? Can they at least hear us speak? Yeah. And some will allow it and some will just kind of. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the worry is that with how real estate is agents, some of them that are good, they, they are, they've made us better. Mm -hmm. There are many that just get in the way. How do you get that authenticity through if there's an agent? It, it is, uh, it's the biggest hurdle. Yeah. The eighth wonder of the world. It is. <laughs> yeah. So you don't know this, but on the drive here, um, a very well-known and respected uh, broker in town uh, and I were on the phone talking about this very issue. Mm. And um, he's one of my favorite people. And I, I, I hang out with him outside of doing business. And we just see it differently. You know, he's, he, and he said to me something that I thought was really telling like it was a black swan mm -hmm. using Chris Voss language. And that is that, Mike, I don't want to get you in front of the seller because you're going to position this deal in such a way that's to your advantage. And I can't protect the seller unless I'm there. And I have responsibility to protect the seller from you. And he said, that's a compliment by the way, because you're going to negotiate a really good deal. But most sellers, aren't capable to deal, aren't competent to deal with somebody like you. You're a sophisticated, um, whatever. I don't want to, you know, yeah, you get absolutely. it right. Same as you guys, you could walk into a room and talk to a seller and understand the deal, understand what they're dealing with. And if you deploy some of the tools like, you know, mirroring, labeling and summarizing, you can get to collaboration pretty quick. And then all of a sudden a deal gets made. And what happens is the, the agent who has their own purview of information says, that could have been this and it was that. So they want, they believe out of a duty, I think, I think, I, this is a, just a new conversation mm -hmm. this morning. Sure, sure true they ones feel, do. They, yeah, they do. They feel a duty to say, okay, I wanna protect this guy. Well, let me go back. I wanna tell you a quick story. First time I ever saw, I was 12 years old and my, my dad owned a body shop and in the back was basically a junkyard. He goes, this, a guy walks into the shop and he says, do you mind if I walk through the junk pile? Dad said, go ahead. He comes back 30 minutes later with a fistful of parts. Like he had two hands around it, sets them on top of my dad's toolbox. And he says, uh, what do you take for these parts? Dad didn't even look at the parts. He said, what do you give me for it? The guy said, $20. Dad said, sold. Should have been 500. What was I, the material? I, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't even remember. Kind of like converter or something. It was uh, chrome parts, if I remember right. Probably an emblem or something that he needed. He walked out and I said, dad, how did you determine the price? And he said, it's a price. It's a good price. And two people agree. So my question to hmm. the agents Maybe. that are protecting the seller, if the seller is not coerced, like I think part of the challenge, the exception that I take to what this gentleman was saying 
is that while I could probably take advantage, I won't. Yeah. Because of what I value, what I believe. And you, you want the next deal from I this I want individual. the next deal. But it, these tools, by the way, this, the tactical empathy, <clears throat> it can be used wrong, in the wrong way. If mm-hmm. you don't have altruistic intent, I mean, the, one of the guys on our team says, we're freaking brain ninjas. Like we can, we can make people do things that we want them to do. If your intent isn't pure and your heart isn't good, that's a very dangerous tool to have in your hand. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of a long story to say the agents, um, your answer, Chris, let's talk is about as, as good as you can get. We have had a few who will let us meet the seller direct and tell them what happened, but it's rare. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the agent's explanation was, was pretty good, especially coming from, uh, you know, if, if that is his actual intent, but also to your point in your story, I mean, a deal is made and I think the agent has to look at the actual buyer themselves. There are buyers out there that are sharks sure, that are looking to throw smoke and mirrors that are really good salesmen, hype people yeah. um, that almost throw just items in the way to cause distractions, wear them down through talking. Absolutely. And then they get the deal done. Um, we both have the long vision or all three of us here, we have the long sure. vision of, of what we're going to do. You know, I, I do worry that some agents are then trying to protect that relationship forever, which I think sometimes can hinder that seller because then they're marketing it again. There may be another, another agent involved when this actually creates the real solution. Yeah. I, I know for us, I mean, sometimes we'll list things on the market, but lots of time when I've, when I've sold properties, I'm trying to do it just, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Sure. You agree on the price. And I agree on the price. I push back on your agent friend with this analogy. Colin loves when I bring up that I used to be an attorney. Um, <laughs> I did practice for 10 years and I would use this analogy all the time with my clients. And I would, th- I, I, I sincerely, and I'm sorry, I just, I'm, it's another thing outside of real estate I can draw an analogy to. Um, my job as the attorney was to take care of the client, but it wasn't to make decisions for the client. Sure. My job was to educate the client And once they have the information they needed, they can make a decision. And so I feel like as an agent, if I come in at a hundred thousand and you have educated the seller that as an agent, you think they can get 110 and because of A, B, and C, if that seller says, I appreciate it, Chris, but I'm going to do a hundred. I want it over with. I don't want to deal with it or, or whatever. I don't want to wait another four months. That's when the agent needs to shut up. And that's when the attorney needs to shut up. It's not about them anymore. Yeah. And I think that you can do your job taking care of your client. And there's a fine line where it starts becoming about you or raising your commission or just arguing an to ego, argue. An ego battle. We're yeah. human, right? Yeah, it's right. not a criticism of these folks. It's a, it's a human nature thing to protect what you think you, you have entitled to you yeah, or what you think you deserve. And so you deserve or your client. Cause that's well, where, that's the problem. That's fair. I, 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 I agree with you actually. It doesn't change the humanity. Yeah. You know, the person who's got a, and, and do they have, do they have the emotional maturity to have those conversations and not be wed to an idea, right? Or have their narrative competing against this conversation you did in that example earlier, few do, right? Few have that emotional maturity. And I don't know when, I, I would guess that the three of us have probably done more transactions than the majority of agents. Mm-hmm. Yes. Just because, a lot of agents don't do a lot of transactions. Mm-hmm. And so it's difficult for me personally to defer to someone who doesn't have the experience, who then is going to iterate what I've said to somebody who may or may not have experience, which is the buyer's agent or seller's agent, who's then going to iterate to the seller. And this agent's all of what we're talking about, you guys, is out the window. It gets distilled down to what you just said, Chris. It's 100000 I'll take it or I won't. I don't do business that way. That's the hard part even about that insurance thing. The insurance claim uh, transfer to a buyer is oftentimes a new concept to many yeah. agents. And they- Because they don't know they're afraid of it and they say no. And uh, yeah, because tell it's a new stipulation. And, and they'll tell the client. Yeah. Nah, you don't have to do that. I don't worry about that. Yeah. It's like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> it doesn't even affect the client. I don't know. It doesn't affect the client. It doesn't affect the agent. Yeah. And it's typically one to two phone calls and one to two emails max. Yeah. I, I'm 100% with you on that. So. 
Uh, We're getting deep into the weeds on these. Oh, I, this I is know, great, that, man. This is great. You're making me want to pick up the this. I want to. I'm, no, I'm, I, 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 this. I'm first on it. Um, I, I, I may, a little depending upon who I like better, I may end up signing this book over to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Awesome. I'm going to keep this up, man. He is, up. He, he is convincing. <laughs>